Good afternoon and welcome to True Crime Mysteries. If you're new to the channel, hello and welcome, and if you're returning, welcome back. Today we are discussing four cold cases that were solved recently with new DNA evidence. Let's get into it. Number 1. Stacy and Jacob Falcom Dewey In the early morning hours of October 28, 1994, a Seattle Times newspaper delivery person started their route in Renton, King County, Washington. It was around 3.30 a.m. when they saw something that didn't look right. Down a small dead-end road lined with trees, they saw a vehicle with its doors open, and next to the vehicle there was something on the road. They stopped and discovered the bodies of a young woman and a young child and called 911. Officers arrived and were able to identify the woman as 23-year-old Stacy Falcon Dewey, and they later identified the child as her 3-year-old son, Jacob Dewey. Both had multiple gunshot wounds, which was the cause of their death. Initially, it was thought to have been a robbery gone wrong. The contents of Stacy's purse had been strewn both inside and outside of her 84 Buick Century, but further evidence suggested that there may have been a darker motive behind the crime. Packing tape that appeared to have been used to bind Stacy was bound on the passenger side of the vehicle. Stacy's belt was undone and several buttons from her shirt were found in the vehicle. The medical examiner also suggested that Jacob may have been killed facing Stacy, or she might have been holding him when he was killed. The two fatal shots that had killed Jacob had gone through his body and hit Stacy in the arm and shoulder. Then she was killed with two shots to the back of the head. Stacy had been covered in bruises, including around her neck and a significant head wound from what was assumed to have been a blow from the back of the gun. Stacy's clothing had also been caked with mud, whereas Jacob had been completely clean, indicating that she might have tried to run away before being wrestled back into the car. The bodies were moved into the middle of the road and it was presumed the killer had intended to drive off in the car but the keys had fallen between the driver's door and the seat and had only been found when the seats had been fully removed. Officers suspected that when the killer couldn't find the keys, he then fled on foot away from the crime scene. Neighbors who lived in the area reported hearing gunshots at around 2.10 a.m giving law enforcement an estimated time of the death of the two victims. Earlier that evening, Stacy had dropped Jacob off with a babysitter, a friend who lived in an apartment complex that Stacy had recently moved out of. Stacy and Jacob had recently moved into an apartment four miles away, and she lived with her boyfriend. Jacob was with a babysitter because Stacy was going out to celebrate her birthday with friends and family and had returned to pick up her son around 1.45 a.m. Witnesses said they saw her get into her vehicle and drive off, and it should have been a short journey home, only a few minutes drive away. Her boyfriend was reported to have been at home at the time of the murders, and he had expected them to return, but he didn't notice they hadn't until officers knocked on the door because he'd fallen asleep. Officers extensively investigated the brutal murders for several years. Several suspects had been ruled out, which had included Stacy's boyfriend and ex-husband, but eventually the case went cold. In 2001, several advances in DNA technology had been made, and it was this case that was reopened to look at for new leads. That year, several samples that had been collected from the autopsy were tested for DNA, and they found male DNA under her fingernails. In 2002, the Washington State Patrol Crime Lab got a match from the incarcerated inmate Jerome Frank Jones, who was in federal prison in California for a murder he committed in 1995. They flew to California to interview him, who, when shown photos of Stacy, denied having known her. In 2002, they also interviewed the building manager of Stacy's old apartment, the one that her friend had lived in and he confirmed that a man named Jerome Jones lived there in 1994. No other connection between Stacy and Jones was found, and in 2002, due to what was described as delays, budget cuts, and other procedural hiccups, the case fell between the cracks for nearly a decade. A podcast highlighted the case in 2019, and it was only because of that coverage that the family had been alerted of the DNA connection when they hadn't known about it before. They then pushed law enforcement to answer why that evidence hadn't produced an arrest. 
In 2021, the case was officially reopened. Several more advances in DNA had occurred since 2002, and investigators wanted to see if there was anything else from that crime scene that could be new for the case. In December 2021, additional DNA evidence was found, this time on the sleeve of Jacob's coat. This DNA connected Jerome Jones directly to the crime scene. On February 18, 2022, the now 51-year-old Jerome Jones was charged in the 1994 murder of Stacy Falcon Dewey, as well as the murder of Jacob Dewey. He has also been charged with robbery and sexual assault. Jones had been scheduled for release in 2030 from his previous convictions, but if convicted of these charges, he will likely be sentenced to multiple life sentences without the possibility of parole. Jerome Jones currently sentenced to 56 years in a California prison for a different murder. But investigators with Renton Police say he is the key to solving this double murder mystery. So thanks for joining us for your news at 10. I'm David Rose. And I'm Jamie Tompkins. Here's the really amazing part of that story. It all began with this letter. We're going to give you a closer look right now. It is a handwritten note delivered to us here at Fox 13 News, written by Vianne Falcon, Stacy's mother and Jacob's grandmother, asking us to look into this case. This after two decades of searching for justice. And that note says it all. She never gave up hope fighting for charges to be brought against Jones for more than two years now. And Fox 13's Jennifer Lee is live in Kent tonight at the courthouse he will be making his first court appearance at. And Jen, this is really another amazing example of the power of DNA, DNA evidence and detectives who refuse to give up. Yeah, very true. That suspect, Jerome Jones, will be making his first appearance here now in less than two weeks, and that's for two counts of aggravated murder in the first degree. The family has been waiting for these charges since 1994, and with that DNA evidence coming to light about 20 years ago, they question why this didn't happen sooner. I've been at my breaking point for a very long time. Vian Falcon says her daughter Stacy was a great mother and her grandson Jacob was a spontaneous boy. All of these years, she's kept them close in her heart since their brutal murder in Renton back in 1994. It wasn't until 2016 that she requested a copy of the medical examiner's report. Had I known about the DNA match in 2002, I'd have never sent for that report. I'd have never read any of it. So I blame them for me having this small, my small smile is gone. According to court documents, the Washington State Patrol Crime Lab detected DNA evidence on Stacy through an oral swab and fingernail clippings that matched a man named Jerome Jones. Falcon says she didn't know DNA evidence existed until many years later in 2019 through a local Seattle Times journalist. We were flabbergasted. We were, we, I just couldn't believe it that they had all that time to get a hold of any one of us and let us know and they hadn't contacted anybody. The 51-year-old suspect is currently behind bars in a California state prison for shooting a man to death in March of 1995, which is just months after allegedly killing Stacy and Jacob in Washington state. Court documents say a number of additional evidence items were submitted and resubmitted over the years, given advances in DNA identification. Because it's pretty embarrassing for them to have sat on this DNA for 18 years and not done anything. In December 2021, investigators learned DNA evidence was also found on the jacket of Falcon's three-year-old grandson. I'm so embarrassed when I go up to the gravesite. I told her I'd have some good news for her. Well, that was like 15, 20 years ago. And now I do have good news for her. Jones will be extradited from California and face a judge here in Washington state. His first appearance is scheduled for February 28th. For now reporting live in Kent, Jennifer Lee, Fox 13 News. Number two, Patricia Barnes. 26 years after Patricia Barnes, a 61-year-old Seattle, Washington resident's body was discovered in, in Olala, Washington, her case has been solved thanks to the advanced DNA testing. 
In 1995, Patricia Barnes was last seen by acquaintances three days before her body was discovered in a ditch. She was found nude in a sleeping bag with several gunshot wounds to her head. Her social circle was very small, which made the case more difficult to solve. During the investigation, the Kitsap County detectives collected and documented over 130 pieces of evidence. The evidence included the sleeping bag, evidence from her body, and cigarette butts found at the crime scene. However, after a large amount of follow-up, they could not identify a suspect. For some time, it was suspected that Patricia was the victim of Robert Lee Yates, also known as a Spokane serial murderer, even though her profile did not match those of Yates' previous victims. Detectives later proved that Yates was stationed in Alabama at the time of Patricia's murder, eliminating him as a suspect. In 2018, the Kitsap County Sheriff's Office reopened Patricia's case. According to an interview with Detective Mike Grant, he and another detective decided to submit evidence they felt would be significant to finding the murderer to the Washington State Patrol Crime Lab. The crime lab developed an unknown male profile using the evidence submitted, which would be the first solid break in the case in decades. However, there was no match after entering the DNA profile into CODIS yet another roadblock in the case, but the detectives were determined to find justice for Patricia Barnes. With the help of the Attorney General's office, the detectives were given several private labs to submit the evidence to for processing. One of those labs was Ortham Labs out of the Woodlands, Texas. Scientists were able to build a male genetic profile. According to Detective Grant, Ortham Labs had identified a first or second cousin, which led them to a name, Douglas Keith Crone. Detectives tracked Crone to Nogales, Arizona in 2016 and learned that Crone had died at his home during an electrical accident. The Pima County Medical Examiner conducted an autopsy and sent blood samples to detectives in Kitsap County. They then in turn sent them to the state crime lab for DNA testing. Two weeks later, they confirmed that Douglas Crone's DNA matched evidence collected from the crime scene using a cigarette butt left at the scene and it was concluded that Crone had been the killer. Realistically, this case was solved in 1995, and it was just a matter of waiting for forensic science and the, uh, the advent of, of genetic genealogy to evolve, and it was just a case waiting to be solved. How they came to meet, nobody knows. Uh, Douglas isn't mentioned in any of the reports. As an acquaintance or a witness or a person of interest, I went through all of the tip logs and no one mentioned his name, so it was just a complete uh, random encounter, I would suspect. Number three, Mary London. Mary London was a sweet and friendly 17-year-old teenager who lived in Sacramento, California. She was a sophomore at the local high school, and her family described her as being developmentally disabled. On January 14, 1981, Mary was reported missing by her family after she wasn't on her scheduled bus ride to the Sacramento High School. The following day, Mary's body was found by a passerby on a stretch of the San Juan Road, a local rural area. She was stabbed several times and sexually assaulted. According to Mary's friends and family, Mary grew up in foster care. Her daily routine was the same every week. Detectives determined that she was in school the day before she went missing. After school, Mary went to a friend's house. The friend told detectives that Mary had left her home to go and visit someone in downtown Sacramento. That friend saw her get on a city bus. Detectives also had a witness who saw Mary get off the bus in downtown Sacramento at 8th and K Streets. This was the last confirmed sighting of Mary. In the 1980s, there wasn't technology like we have today. Detectives talked to everyone who knew Mary and collected evidence carefully from the scene, including DNA from Mary's body. When DNA procedures advanced, the DNA collected from the crime scene was resubmitted in the early 2000s to try and find a match for a suspect. Unfortunately, there were no DNA matches in CODIS, so the case went cold again. After 35 years, the case was reopened in 2016 by the Sacramento Police Department detectives. According to a posting on their Facebook page, the detectives were asking for a community to help in finding a man named Daryl. He was a known friend of Mary's, however, he was not considered a suspect at the time. After submitting his DNA to CODIS, it was determined that Daryl did not murder Mary. Forty years after Mary's murder, detectives announced that they had found who murdered Mary. 
Detectives named Vernon Parker as Mary's killer. They had identified him using genetic genealogy and advanced DNA practices. Detectives learned during their investigation that Parker was involved in sex trafficking and a prostitution ring. According to detectives, Parker had been murdered in downtown Sacramento, about a block from where Mary had went missing, and they knew that was not a coincidence as he was known to hang out in that area. While justice cannot be served, the determination and persistence of the Sacramento Police Department have given Mary's family closure. Kirsten, we first told you about this story last night. The Sacramento Police Department will make the official announcement today, ending a 39-year-old cold case. Sacramento County District Attorney Anne Marie Schubert says the breakthrough came with the use of new DNA technology. Sac PD investigators worked closely with the District Attorney's Office to use the new tool and traditional DNA testing to link a man named Vernon Parker to the brutal murder of Mary London. I mean, remember, we're in the midst of a crisis, but it's not going to stop us from solving crime, prosecuting crime, and doing what we have to do every day. It may look a little differently, and you might do a lot more Zoom meetings or whatever it is, but at the end of the day, we're still, the criminal justice system goes on. Mary's half-sister, Esther Snyder, says Mary was a developmentally disabled 10th grade student at Sacramento High. She was living with foster parents and never came home on January 14, 1981. Her body was found the next morning on this then rural stretch of San Juan Road in North Sacramento. She'd been sexually assaulted and stabbed several times. It turns out Mary's killer was murdered in 1982, a little more than a year after her death. And now Schneider wants to thank investigators for their tireless work. Thank God, you know, I'm real happy they, they found somebody. Coming up on Late News Tonight, the detective who first worked the case meets Mary's families. The former 90-year-old detective says not even a global pandemic would keep him from celebrating this moment. Well, that is it for this video. As always, thank you so much for watching. If you like this content and what I do over here, please don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell so you don't miss my next upload. And if you could give the video a like if you enjoyed the content, that would be much appreciated as it helps the channel to grow. We also have channel membership as well as Patreon if you want to get more behind the scenes content as well as exclusive content or just to support the channel. In the description box of this video, you will also find links to all my socials as well as other goodies. But that is it for me. Thank you so much for being here. I will see you all in the next one. Bye for now.